What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and welcome to week 14 of my weekly NFL pick show for the 2017-2018 NFL season. Week 14, our little man's growing up so fast. We had a pretty stellar week last week in week 13. We were above 500 in all three phases of the game, straight up against the spread and over under. Straight up, pretty excellent week, 11 and 5 straight up in week 13 action. That has us 125 up, 67 down with no ties so far this season. Like we said, against the spread, we were above 500. Not by much, but we were above 500, and that's what matters. 8, 7, and 1 in the 16 games in Week 13 against the spread. That has us 94 up, 90 down, with 8 full pushes on the season. Picked up our 8th last week. And what a week we had over under. My over under record surpasses my straight up record, and I think that might be a first Maybe for me ever, but I think certainly this season, I think it's a first. 12 and 4 on the over under in week 13. That has us now just 10 games under 500 with the over under, which, given how I started the season, I think is pretty incredible. We're 90 up, 100 down with two pushes over under, coming off of a really strong 12 and 4 week. My platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks in week 13, incredibly successful across the board. We were 4-0 and straight up, and for, I think, maybe only the second time this season, 4-0 and against the spread. So we had just a great, we raked in on the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks in week 13. And we were 2-2 two and two on the over-under, which means actually two of our four over-under losses came in those top four games. The bronze pick, I told you to take Tennessee over Houston. That works out 24 to 13 in favor of the Titans. Against the spread win, I told you to go Tennessee minus seven. We lost that one over under. I told you to go over 42 points. They only get to 37. Silver pick, New England beats Buffalo handily. Three possession game, 23 to three. Against the spread, it was a win. New England only favored by eight points. We'll take that one. And it was an over-under win, as I told you, to stay under 49 points, and they only get to 26. I knew that was going to stay well under the 49 points, and that's exactly what happened. Gold pick. Told you to take Jacksonville over Indy. They do that handily. 20-point victory, 30-10. to 10. It was an against-the-spread win. Told you to go Jacksonville, minus 9.5. And, and it was an over-under loss by a single point i told you to go over 41 points and they only get to 40 now the platinum pick we swept it number one we swept that pick straight up against the spread and over under but this might be my proudest sweep of the season because not only did i tell you to take the chargers to beat cleveland that was super comfortable told you to stay under the 42 and a half points that happened and actually that number went up by a by, up by a point later on in the week so it was like 43 and a half so it stayed, even stayed under that but it wasn't against the spread win because i told you that cleveland would cover the plus 13 and a half and they did that they only lost the game by nine points definitely my proudest sweep of the season we did great with the platinum gold silver and bronze picks last week the picks this week are much more difficult in those four picks we'll see how we do Taking a look at the Bridgewater's Finest and Hatbox Pick'em Pools for Season 6 of my show and Year 4 of Hatbox's Pool. In the Bridgewater's Finest Pool, I still sit in 6th place now out of 35 managers. Actually, I shouldn't say still because I think I was 5th last week. I was. So I actually dropped down another space there. 6th out of 35 with 1,089 out of 1,522 possible confidence points. That's a clip of 72%, which in any other season would be a championship clip, but not this year, because this year we got killers in this pool. In week 13, I brought in 105 out of 136 possible confidence points. That's a clip of 77%, and we will never be upset at 77 percent shout out to our week 13 winner for the second week in a row he's the hottest prog in the community it's martin wong it's west coast martin another 14 and 2 week which is his second consecutive 14 and 2 week 124 out of 136 possible confidence points 
That's a clip of 91% and was good enough for his second straight victory in our pool. More than a teal and remains the overall leader, 131 and 61 on the season. So he's actually six better than I am straight up this season. 1120 out of 1522 possible confidence points. That is an incredible clip of 74%. Worth pointing out, the top nine in this pool, so nine out of 35, the top nine are only separated by what basically amounts to one great week, 45 points. It's less than 50 points and it's the top nine. This is still anybody's game. So if you're, especially if you're in that top nine, 10, 11, you really, you can't miss even a single pick. Because if you do, it's so close. You still have a shot at this. Moving over to the hat box pool, I remain in a tie for sixth place out of 39 managers making picks with my 125 straight up correct picks out of the 192 NFL games that have been played so far that's a clip of 65 percent and we certainly won't look a gift horse in the mouth in week 13 I brought in 11 of the 16 games picked correctly that's a clip of 69 percent which is right around that 70 percent mark where you want to be shout out to our week 13 winner it was shared in fact we had two it was M Potvan one and Half Moon's pick, Stephen Coleman, a fellow NFL YouTube prog. They both went 13-3 and three in the hat box pool in week 13. That's a clip of 81%, and it was good enough for the two of them to win week 13. Rel Eagles fly, TJ Harmon remains our overall leader by, I think, a single game. So it's really close at the top. 133 out of 192 games picked correctly. That is a clip of 69%, and it's just right where you want to be in terms of straight up picks if you're a prog and you take this seriously so shout out to west coast martin m pot van one and half moons picks for winning week 13 across the pools and to more than a tealin and rel eagles fly for remaining the overall leaders in the bridgewater's finest pool and hatbox pool respectively let's take a peek into fantasy corner and see how my four fantasy football teams did across week 13 action it's a good thing this wasn't the first week of the playoffs or else, you know, I'd be out in pretty well every league. I only went one and three in week 13 games in the professionals dynasty fantasy football league, the league that I run and I commish. I pulled out a come from behind win against Max Maniacs that has me nine and four locked into the number two second place position. Next week, the playoffs begin in pretty well every league that I'm in. I have a playoff quarterfinals matchup against Gavin O'Connor, Gavin OC4, a fellow NFL YouTube prog. That is a projected win for me by around 10, 11 points, but Gavin and I play each other close, so anything can happen in that matchup. In the NFL YouTube prognosticators fantasy football league, I lost last week to Gavin. So I play Gavin now two weeks in a row in two different leagues. So I put up the loss there. It was close though. Had Antonio Brown not played, which for a good portion of last week, he was trending towards not playing. I would have won that matchup by a couple of points, but didn't work out that way. That has me at nine and four. I'm locked in as the number one seed in that league, which means I've earned a buy this week in the playoff quarterfinals. Six teams make the playoffs in that league. I'm the number one seed. I got a buy this week. So shout out to Max Maniacs and Gavin for the matchups last week. Thank you very much. And Gavin coming at you again in a different league. Let's try to get a different result. As I take a sip of my lemon ginger blend from Nerd Teas, as I'm trying to kind of fight off a bug, at least I feel like I am, I'm going to take this opportunity to remind you that if you go to the description of the video on YouTube or go to the description of the episode on SoundCloud or iTunes, you are going to find all of my results from week 13, all of my straight up against the spread and over under plays for week 14 in the NFL. You're going to find information on joining the Bridgewater's Finest and Hatbox Pick'em Pools for Season 6 of my show and Year 4 of Hatbox's Pool. It is never too late. As M. Potvan just displayed, it is never too late to get your name shouted out on the show if your picks are good enough going head-to-head -head against mine and a ton of other NFL YouTube progs within this community. 
it's never too late. You're going to find information on joining the NFL YouTube Prognosticators Facebook page. All your favorite progs are there. Some week 14 episodes are already up. We got some early birds in that league, in that uh, league, on that page, I should say. Got a bunch of early birds there that love to get their picks out as early as humanly possible. Get in there, join in on the conversation, join the Discord channel, join in on the fun. You're going to find information on subscribing to the Hatbox Nation YouTube channel. I'm continuing my parlay series all season long. I'll probably even continue it through the playoffs, if I'm being honest. So make sure that you subscribe there. You'll find Billy B's picks. you find Hatbox Nation power rankings. You're going to find a bunch of great stuff there. We're trying to top 200 subs by the end of the season. Let's see if we can do that. Also, I was so damn close to picking up two parlays this week. So close. Philly, why'd you have to screw me? And you're also going to find information on Nerd Tees, nerdtees.ca. It is not too late to get your Christmas orders in there for a hard-to-buy person on your list. You're going to find something on that site, some blend, some blend, some taste combination that you know that person is going to love. Remember, use the promo code BWFINEST at checkout. Save yourself 15% on your orders. Free shipping in Canada on any order over $50. Like I say, I'm enjoying the lemon ginger right now and it is delicious, soothing my throat, making me feel better so I can bring these picks to you. Nerdtease.ca, promo code BWFINEST. I believe I said it last week, a prog's work is never done, but I gotta tell you, on the picks this week, I'm just trying to simplify things a little bit. Maybe it's in part due to the fact that I'm not feeling 100%, but I'm just trying to, why overcomplicate things for yourself? Trying to simplify things a little bit this week, looking at playoff situations, things like that. Maybe not relying quite as much on the numbers and a little more on the gut. Let's take a look at the week 14 NFL picks. We're going to get started in Atlanta where the Falcons and the Saints are going to go head to head. This is going to be a hard-nosed NFC South matchup. And you have the Saints with the opportunity to basically all but bury the Atlanta Falcons and really hurt their playoff chances. I mean, well, certainly chances at the division, but definitely hurt the playoff chances as well. These two teams kind of going in different directions. Saints coming off of a win last week. Falcons put up the loss. Atlanta's only 3-3 three and three at home and 1-1 one and one against this division. Meanwhile, the Saints have not lost within the NFC South and are 4-2 and two on the road. This will be back-to-back -back division matchups for the Saints. Meanwhile, it's the third straight home game for Atlanta. Somehow, I just don't have this feeling that Sean Payton, Drew Brees, and the Saints will overlook an opportunity to really drive a nail, potentially, in the coffin of a division rival in their playoff hopes because who knows what can happen once you're one and done come playoff time so i don't think the saints are going to overlook that opportunity they've been a much better road team than they have been historically this season i'm kind of feeling the saints i think we're going to go with new orleans here let's take the saints on the road in atlanta to beat the falcons Although as a note to everyone that's like, oh, Julio Jones, you know, what a, what a terrible time to, uh, to put up uh, a bad fantasy performance. It was, dude, it was the Vikings. Like, well, like what are you going to do? Like, they're the best defense, one of the best defenses in football. Like, you, you, it's not exactly like he chose to have a bad game. On the line here, Atlanta is a point and a half dog at home after this line opened at Falcons minus two. So now you have New Orleans on the other side. They're a point and a half favorite. We like them to win. Let's take that New Orleans minus a point and a half at Atlanta. Total in this game is 53 and a half points. The two teams are a combined 12 and 12 over under, so no significant lean one way or the other. But I'm kind of feeling the under in this one. I think these two defenses know each other very well. I think they're going to play this game well. It's two talented offenses. But, of course, Atlanta did have a bit of a down week last week. Again, against a good defense. New Orleans still put up 30 on Carolina. Again, another division matchup. But I'm just kind of feeling the under in this one. So let's stay under the 53.5 points in New Orleans, Atlanta. Let's go to Buffalo now where the Bills are going to play host to the Colts in one of the more interesting matchups this week, if for no other reason than the fact that Vegas has no idea what they're doing with this game. 
Right now, there's absolutely nothing. There's no spread. There's no total. And a big reason for that is they don't know what's going to happen with the Bills quarterback situation with Tyrod Taylor and his knee injury. Taylor basically injured the same knee twice in their game last week against New England, was carted off in the second half of that game. My understanding of the injury that he has, and I believe basically it's a bruise or some kind of contusion to the ligament. My understanding of that is basically we're not going to know his status until at the earliest, probably Friday. And I would be shocked, really shocked, if he's going to be capable of playing this week. So I think I'm going to have to play this game as if Nathan Peterman is the quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, and that certainly is a downgrade for their passing game across the board, and the run game too. Basically, the injury that Taylor has is a three to four week recovery time to 100%. Now, of course, that's not taking into consideration that Taylor's a professional athlete and has all the resources that that entails. So, I mean, he'll probably be back next week. I would just be really surprised if there's enough turnaround time for him to play this week. This is back-to-back road games for the Colts. They're coming off the loss last week against, of course, a better team in Jacksonville. But uh, I still don't like the Colts' chances as not a very good road team. I believe they're 1-5, in five, or I, believe, I think it's 1-5. in five. But they're not. Uh, the point is they're not a good road team. And I don't like the prospects of them having to play back-to-back road games and winning either one of them. So I think even if Nathan Peterman is your quarterback here for Buffalo, which again is the way that I'm going to play it, I still think the Bills win this game. They're a better team top to bottom. Their run game can take over this game, dictate the pace. Uh, The the Colts don't really have anything for them on defense. Now, I understand they can kind of stuff eight guys in the box, which is a phrase in football that I love to say at every opportunity. Stuff eight guys in there to stop the run game, but I still think Buffalo's run game is good enough and the offensive line is good enough that it's going to open up some opportunities and play action for Nathan Peterman. I think he'll play better this week. And honestly, I just think Buffalo's the better team. I'm going to give it to the Bills. So let's take Buffalo at home to beat the Colts. On the line, like I said, there's absolutely nothing. There is no spread in this game. There is no total. So I have to treat this like a pick 'em until proven otherwise, basically. So we're going to take Buffalo as a pick 'em because we like Buffalo to win. When the line for this game does come out, come back to the video, pay attention to the comments section. I'll put it in the comments section and I'll pin it at the top so you'll know that's what my pick has changed to. But in the absence of a spread, we got to take the team that we like to win as a pick 'em. Let's take Buffalo as a pick 'em at home against Indy. Again, no total in this game either. The two teams are a combined 12 and 12 over under, so no real significant lean there one way or the other. But I think the watershed mark for this game is somewhere around 44 45, even with Nathan Peterman at quarterback for Buffalo. So if you get significantly lower than a 45, consider grabbing the under. If for some miraculous, stupid reason you get like a 47, jump all over the under. That's where I'm going to tell you to go in Indy Buffalo. Let's go to Cincinnati now where the Bengals are going to play host to the Chicago Bears. Both of these teams coming off of losses last week. Chicago's I would have said before I watched the game last night would have been arguably more embarrassing, giving up five field goals only and losing the game to the 49ers and Jimmy Garoppolo in his 49ers debut, who honestly didn't look terrible, but I mean, it's the 49ers. But Chicago, they put up two touchdowns, but nothing else, and it wasn't good enough. Then I watched the Monday Nighter. Cincinnati, boy, I tell you, they got out to such a lead at the half. Ryan Shazier is out. You have every opportunity as the Cincinnati Bengals to put your foot on the throat of the division leader and not let them back up. And what do they do? They lose the game 23 to 20. Now, the Monday Nighter was just a car wreck. Vontaze Burfecht looked like he was injured twice in that game, was taken off. Obviously, we got the Ryan Shazier thing, which we'll talk about when we talk about the Pittsburgh-Baltimore game. But Cincinnati, like, you had an opportunity. And, and your playoff lives are on the line. And you give up a 14-point lead in the second half. You're outscored 20-3 to in the second half and lose the game in your own building. 
That to me is nigh on inexcusable. And basically now you just have the Bengals playing for whatever pride they have left. Luckily for them, this is an incredibly winnable matchup for them with Chicago coming into town. While it's worth pointing out that Chicago has beaten both of the AFC opponents that they have played so far this season, they're only 1-4 and four on the road. Their offense is playing pretty well terribly right now, and the defense is not playing well enough to make up for that fact. If Cincinnati does have any pride left, they win this game in a walk. So this is going to be the show-me pick. This is, I guess, the show-me pick for Cincinnati. I'm going to ride with the Bengals, and I'm going to make them prove to me that they're either good enough or they're not good enough. Let's go with Cincinnati at home because, my God, if they lose this game. On the line, the Bengals are favored by a full touchdown. And originally, I balked at this completely and went Chicago plus seven, but I've kind of changed my mind on it. The Bengals, at the very least, are 4-0 against the spread in their last four games. They might have lost last night, but they did beat the spread. So they're 4-0 in their last four games against the spread. If I like them to win, let's ride the somewhat hot hand against the spread, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Let's go Cincinnati, minus 7, and damn it, show me. Total in this game is 39.5 points. The two teams are a combined 10 and 14 over under this season. So that's a decent lean towards the under. But I'm actually going to tell you to go over on it. Again, Chicago's defense not playing well enough to justify how bad the offense is playing. We saw what Cincinnati gave up in the second half of that game. The Bengals defense looked tired, looked worn out in the second half of that game. I realize it's against a much better offense than they're going to be playing this week, but still, I think Chicago's capable of scoring a couple of touchdowns here, and if I like Cincinnati to cover the full touchdown on the spread, then I think I got to go over on it. Let's go over 39.5 points in Cincinnati, Chicago. Speaking of a show-me pick, we got another show-me pick, but for a completely different reason. Let's go to Kansas City now. Chiefs, Raiders, AFC West matchup, which is now mind-blowingly a matchup for the division. The Chiefs keep finding new and spectacular ways to blow games. Make no mistake about it, right now, the Chiefs are at best a glass cannon, and at worst, a bad football team. You lose to the Giants by a field goal. You lose to Buffalo by a non-converted touchdown. Six points in your own building. Then you go to the Jets. You put up 31 points on the Jets. And you let them put up 38. And you lose that game too. The only aspect of the Kansas City Chiefs right now that doesn't suck is Alex Smith. Alex Smith, he's up over 3,200 yards. He's thrown 23 touchdowns. He has a real great rapport, especially with Tyreek Hill. This is a top 10 pass offense in football. Alex Smith is the quarterback of this team. And the fact that anybody was talking about, is there a quarterback in controversy in Kansas City, is ridiculous, certainly within the context of just this season. I think it was a smart idea for Andy Reid to hand over the play calling duties to his offensive coordinator. Certainly it worked out. They put up 31 points, 14 points in the first quarter, but they just, the defense couldn't hold on. The defense is what sucks on this football team. And I'm going to call somebody out specifically, Marcus Peters. That was a stupid thing to do. And whatever fines or anything that happens to come from that, you deserve them. So this one here, you know how I said this was a show me pick? It's a show me pick in the same way straight up, but it's going to be a different way against the spread. This is a show me pick for the Kansas City Chiefs. You're at home. It's a division rival. This is the team that you should know as well as they know themselves. I think this is a game that you could very conceivably lose. But if you want any chance at this division, you need to win this game. You need to win this game. The Raiders don't necessarily need to win this game. It would be good if they did, but they don't necessarily need to win this game because they would still be able to recover, and they've played well enough lately that they can still have the confidence to recover. If Kansas City loses this game, you might as well tank the rest because what's the point? You would then have lost, what, seven of eight? It's just, again, it's just crazy that Kansas City is in this position. 
Show me that you want to win this division. Show me you're a better football team than I think you are right now. Show me that Kareem Hunt is not a bit of a flash in the pan. I've got him on my fantasy team. Please, God, show me that you're a little bit more than a flash in the pan. You can run on the Raiders. Show me. I'm going to take the Chiefs here, probably against my better judgment, but I'm going to take Kansas City at home to beat Oakland. At the very least, the Raiders are only 500 against this division, and they're under 500 on the road, so hey, at least that's in my favor. On the line, the Chiefs are favored by four points at home, which is ridiculous. Take Oakland plus four. I'm just going to take the team that was the last team to actually win a game against the spread, and that's the Raiders. So let's go Oakland plus four and hedge the bets. Total in this game is 47 and a half points. The two teams are 12 and 12 on the over under this season. They put up, what, 61 earlier this season. But I'm actually going to tell you to stay under on it. I think this is going to be a closer, tighter matchup. Kansas City's offense, they did well last week, but they haven't been as good as they were earlier in the season. Let's stay under on this one, maybe against my better judgment. But let's stay under 47 and a half in Oakland, Kansas City. Let's go to New York now where the Giants are going to play host to division rival Dallas and the hammer finally fell in New York. Ben McAdoo out, the GM Smith I believe his name was, out. So a lot of changeover in New York. You can't take the Giants in this game after a mid-season coach firing. You've only got six days with your new staff to try to sort of come up with something and come up with a game plan here. You've got to take Dallas, especially after Dallas finally started playing better and won a game last week. Dallas on the road. Let's take the Cowboys in New York to beat the Giants. And I think if you go back and you look at the statistics, look at it historically, mid-season coaching changes, it makes a bit of a difference in the NFL, but it's certainly not spectacular. Really across all the professional sports, a mid-season coaching change rarely results in greatly improved results. So we're going to stick with the Cowboys on the road. On the line, the Giants are four and a half point dogs at home. Dallas favored by the four and a half. I'm actually going to tell you to go Dallas minus four and a half. The Cowboys are three and one against the spread on the road by favorites of less than a touchdown, which is what they are in this game. It's a pretty decent matchup here with the Giants who have nothing left to play for, except a little bit of pride. I think this will be a competitive football game, but let's take Dallas minus the four and a half. Total in this game is 41 and a half points. The two teams are 11 and 13 over under this season, which is a slight lean towards the under, but it's such a low number. I think we're going to take over the 41 and a half. Let's see what this new Giants offense can do with the new head coach. Let's see what the defense is capable of doing. Dallas had a really good offensive game last week. Let's see if they keep that going. We're going to go over 41 and a half points in Dallas, New York. And I mean, it's worth pointing out, I'm not saying, but I'm saying, the Cowboys aren't exactly dead yet in terms of the wild card. If Atlanta loses this week, which I expect them to, and Dallas wins this week, which I expect them to, all of a sudden you're going to have Atlanta, Dallas, and probably a couple of other teams right there at 7-6 and six for the number 6 wild card spot. So Dallas is not out of this thing yet. Let's go to Tampa Bay now where the Bucs are going to play host to another one of those teams at 6-6, six and six, looking to stay alive in the NFC wildcard race. That's the Detroit Lions. This is back-to-back -back road games for the Lions. They lost in Baltimore last week. Now they got to go to Tampa. Much easier matchup for Detroit. Of course, there is the question mark in this game about the health of Matt Stafford. And it's also worth pointing out, up to the point that Matt Stafford came out of that game against Baltimore with the hand that got stepped on, all of the uh, MRIs and x-rays about that, by the way, have come back negative. So I think really it's just soreness. Up to the point that he went out of that game, I believe the game was 30-20. to 20. So, I mean, they're trailing by 10 points. The game ended 44-20, to 20, but that was a closer game at that point. Sure, it's two possessions, but two possessions is certainly not insurmountable. Ask Pittsburgh. But this is our other game this week where there's no spread and no total, and that's exactly why. Who knows what's going to happen with the Matt Stafford situation? If I was a betting man, which I kind of am, you know, but whatever. If I was a betting man, I would bet that Stafford's going to play. He's been durable. He's been tough throughout his career. I think he plays in this game. I think this is just soreness. I don't think it's any kind of other issue above that. 
it's concerning that it's his throwing hand, but I don't think there's a huge risk that Stafford does not play in this football game. And given that, I think I got to take Detroit in this game because, again, it's another team fighting for their playoff lives. Tampa Bay is not that team. They're 4-8. and eight. They're essentially out of things right now, kind of playing for a little bit of pride. The defense hasn't been great. They've lost two straight games. They're only 2-6 and six against NFC opponents, whereas if you look at the Lions, they're a bit above 500 at 5-4. and four. Only 2-3 and three outside of the division, but whatever. In a matchup of two teams that have lost two games in a row, I'm going to defer to the better offense, the significantly better offense, and that is the Detroit Lions. So let's take Detroit on the road in Tampa to beat the Bucks. On the line, obviously, there is no line because Vegas is quote-unquote cowards, and I quote-unquote even though I'm the one that says they're cowards. So we're going to take Detroit as a pick em in this game because we like them to win. Once again, when the line does come out, I will put it in the comments section of the YouTube video, so make sure you come back in a couple of days when there's a line. No total in this game, but the two teams are the best combined over-under record of any of the matchups we're going to look at this week at 16 and 8 over under so two-thirds of their games combined have gone over i think the watershed mark in this game is going to be somewhere around 50 points so if you get anything that begins with a four take the over if you get anything that is like a low 50 you might want to consider taking the over as well just based on the way the two teams trend if for whatever reason it's a high 50, well then I don't think you take the over in that. But anything that starts with a 4, take the over. A low 50, take the over as well. That's how I'm going to tell you to go in Detroit, Tampa. Let's go to Carolina now where we have the Panthers coming off the loss last week against the Saints. And they're going to play host to the red-hot Minnesota Vikings. Now basically, undisputably, the hottest team in the NFC. Vikings riding an eight-game win streak, obviously getting it done at home, getting it done on the road. They're five and one in both scenarios, and they're going to go into Carolina, where you have the Panthers, who are only three and two at home, not exactly the greatest record. But again, you're talking motivation. Which of these two teams do you think is more motivated to win this football game? I would argue it has to be Carolina. The Vikings are a game clear of getting a bye through the first round in the NFC playoffs. It is not imperative that Minnesota wins this football game. I would argue it's imperative that the Carolina Panthers win this football game. I've got New Orleans winning in Atlanta. If New Orleans does not win in Atlanta, then you've got Atlanta up at eight and five. If Carolina loses this game, they're also at eight and five. But if Carolina wins this game, all of a sudden, bingo, bango, they're tied for the division lead. Carolina has got way more in this football game to play for than the Vikings do. Even though I think Minnesota is objectively the better football team, probably from top to bottom, it's worth pointing out that this is back-to-back -back road games for the Vikings. They did win last week. They're more than capable of winning back-to-back -back road games. The question is, will they against a very talented team on the other side in the Carolina Panthers? This is an upset, but I actually kind of like Carolina in this football game. I think Carolina, they have to be hungrier to win the game, and that's the way we're going to go. I'm going to take the Carolina Panthers at home to knock off the Minnesota Vikings. On the line, Carolina's a three-point dog at home. We like them to win. Let's take the points. Carolina plus three. Total in this game is 41 points. The two teams are combined 13 and 11 on the over-under this season. Slight lean towards the over. It's a low number. It's two good defenses, but the number's so low. I think we got to take over the 41 points in Carolina, Minnesota. Let's go to Houston now briefly for the Texans playing host to the San Francisco 49ers. And hey, look at that. The Jimmy Garoppolo era in San Francisco begins with a victory. He didn't throw a touchdown pass, but they did get the win 15-14 to against the Chicago Bears. Five field goals for them, but they got the win. That was on the road. This is now back-to-back -back road games. They got to go into Houston. Is San Francisco a team that I'm willing to give enough credit to that they're going to win back-to-back -back road games? I don't think so. 
Houston is certainly not setting the world on fire. Two straight losses, and they've lost four of their last five, but they have beaten an NFC opponent this season. They are 500 at home. Three of their four wins have come in their own building. Let's go with Houston in this one. I think it's a good situation for them. We're going to take the Texans at home to beat the 49ers. On the line, Houston is favored by three points at home. I like them to win. They've got a better against the spread record than San Francisco does. So let's take Houston minus the three points. Total in this game is 42 and a half points. The two teams are a combined 11 and 13 on the over under, which is a slight lean towards the under. And I think that's the way I'm going to go with it. Let's go under the 42 and a half points in Houston, San Francisco. I think I need to see the 49ers score a touchdown before I can give them credit for an over. Let's go to Denver now where the reeling, reeling, reeling Broncos are going to play host to the New York Jets. And hey, Jets are scoring themselves some points. This is an aside, but it was a really funny meme. Has everyone seen that Ben Roethlisberger meme about that video where he kind of makes the ooh face when it looks at the uh, the AFC West standings after five weeks and then it cuts to the current NFC West standings and he looks at it he's just like oh and, and it's just funny because it's like it's Denver right because Denver was right up at the top after five weeks and then now they're what three and nine I think and just absolutely falling apart both offensively and defensively. Broncos will get a keep to lead back this week. I suppose I should have mentioned in the KC Oakland game, Oakland's going to get Crabtree back as well after both appealed their suspensions and they were both reduced to just a single game. So that'll certainly help them. But again, you look at these New York Jets and the Jets are uncharacteristically to them scoring way more points than they had been before. I think if you went into this season and said to Jets fans, hey, Jets fans, you're going to be five and seven after 12 games hell you could have told them you're gonna have five wins this season i think jets fans would have been thrilled with that coming out of the bye week they scored 27 points against carolina they lost that game but they still scored the 27 points and then last week against kansas city bingo bango 38 points and the victory and it was balanced scoring too. It's scoring across all four quarters. They kind of struggled a little bit in the third quarter but turned it on in the fourth to win that football game Look, the Jets' offense playing pretty well right now. If the defense can hold up, this is a really good situation for them. You might worry about a little bit of a look-ahead game for the Jets, even though they're not really, really contending for a playoff spot. But it's going to be back-to-back road games next week when the Jets have to go to New Orleans and play the Saints. So they may be overlooking Denver a little bit. Denver, obviously, a difficult place to win in. But I honestly, I really like the Jets here. I think this is a good spot for them against the Denver team that looks like it's completely fallen apart. So look, I think I've been giving a little too little credit to the Jets lately. Let's take them this week. Jets on the road, go to Denver and beat the Broncos. On the line, Denver's a point and a half dog at home, which is so strange that the Jets are a road favorite, but this is the world that we're living in. So Jets are favored by a point and a half. On the road, we like them to win. We might as well take that. New York Jets minus a point and a half at Denver. But again, just to show how bad the Broncos have been, that's a one in four road team that's a point and a half favorite. And it's completely justified. Total in this game is 41 points. The two teams, interestingly enough, are a combined 14 and 10 over under this season. Slight lean towards the over. It's a low number. Let's do that. Over 41 points in Jets Broncos. Let's go to Los Angeles now where the Rams are going to play host to the Philadelphia Eagles. Obviously the Eagles losing just their second game of the season last week. But it's not really just that they lost. Is that Seattle and that defense really made the Eagles look human. This is going to be back-to-back road games for Philadelphia. Coming off of a loss last week, the Rams are a good football team that have been scoring a lot of points all season. They've won two straight games. They've won four of their last five, and I'm going to take the Eagles. I guess there's really no huge secret to this. It's just it's just a gut feeling. I Number one, I really think the NFC 
playoffs, the NFC Championship game, I believe goes through Philadelphia. I think they need to keep winning for that to be the case. I think they're too good of a football team to lose two consecutive games, even if it is two consecutive road games. This is no disrespect to the LA Rams whatsoever. I understand that they're the favorite in this game, but I'm going to take the upset, quote unquote, and I'm going to take the Philadelphia Eagles on the road to beat the Rams. On the line, as we mentioned, Rams are two and a half point favorites at home. We like Philly to win the game. Let's take the points. Philly plus two and a half. Total in this game is 50 and a half points. The two teams are combined only 13 and 11 on the over under this season, which is only a slight lean towards the over. It's a high number at 50 and a half. Philly's offense kind of struggled last week against Seattle. So I think I'm going to play it conservative in this one. And we're going to go under the 50 and a half points in Philly, Los Angeles. Let's go to Jacksonville now. Jags got off the schneid last week, back to the happy side of par. They won last week. They're 4-1 and one in their last five. They're 4-2 and two at home, but they have to welcome in a Seattle Seahawks team that all of a sudden, not only have they won two straight games, they figured out how to run the football. How about that? I actually really like the combination of Mike Davis and J.D. McKissick. I think that's the right combination for the Seahawks. McKissick can be that good change of pace back, pass catching back. He has value, certainly in PPR fantasy formats. He has value there as the pass catching back. You got Russell Wilson that can do a ton of great things with the football. All of a sudden, it looks like Seattle's starting to peak at the right time. If there's one place that the Jags have struggled this season, it is against NFC opponents. They've lost both of their games against NFC opponents. Now, obviously, they have to play the NFC West, really good football teams. But Seattle is, in and of itself, a really good football team. They've come back to be now the best defense in that division, in the NFC West. And look, this is going to be a tight defensive matchup. Two of the better defenses in football, arguably two of the best. I just, I really like Seattle here. I think Seattle's on a bit of a roll. They're a better road team than they have been in seasons past. Jacksonville has struggled a little bit against their NFC counterparts. Let's take Seattle here. A bit of an upset, but we're going to take the Seahawks on the road in Jacksonville to beat the Jags. On the line, Jacksonville is a three-point favorite at home. Seattle, three-point dog on the road. We like Seattle to win. Let's take the points and go Seattle plus three total in this game is 39 and a half points and i believe it is it is in fact the lowest total tied with uh, chicago cincinnati that we're going to look at this week two teams are combined nine and 15 on the over under the worst combined over under record that we're going to look at this week it's such a low number But I think you have to stay under on it even so. Leonard Fournette, I think, found the end zone last week. But he's been struggling a little bit as of late. Jacksonville's pass game, still not the best thing since sliced bread. Seattle can put up points. But man, Jacksonville's defense is just plain deadly. So it's such a low number. But I think you still have to stay under 39.5 points. That's what we're going to do in Seattle-Jacksonville. And the last game we're going to look at before we get into the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week 14 is the aforementioned Pittsburgh-Baltimore AFC North matchup. Just like Ben Roethlisberger put it last night in the postgame, it's just more AFC North football. Uh, And this is a game that I personally can't wait for. But at the same time, it's a game that is going to be, at least in part, dictated by its injuries, certainly on the defensive side of the ball. Of course, Baltimore, you got Jimmy Smith out for the season, and then also, at the same time, then busted four games for uh, by the substance abuse policy. So he got busted for four games. He's out for the season anyway. He can serve it while he's injured, so that's not a big deal. But then now Pittsburgh, we go back to the Ryan Shazier injury. And what this is, is a spinal contusion. That's more significant than, I know some people were kind of talking like, oh, I think it's probably just a stinger that he's reacting bad to. It's not. It's a spinal contusion. And this is a huge issue for this player. I just want to read to you uh, just kind of a brief excerpt from a doctor out of Colorado, uh, Dr. Alan Wong. And it's in reference to, you know, spinal cord contusions, stingers, things like that, in reference to professional athletes. So as per Dr. Alan Wong. 
Players who have experienced spinal cord contusions may have to wait weeks or months before they can return to play. In both stinger and contusion injuries, a player must be symptom-free, be neurologically intact, demonstrate sports-specific activity, and be cleared medically before returning to play. This is an injury that has even an outside, but has the potential to bring about paralysis. So this is not something that anybody can screw with. I would be surprised if we see Ryan Shazier for the rest of this season. I would be shocked. Even if Pittsburgh makes it to the Super Bowl, I would be shocked. This is not like a Thomas Davis uh, broken arm that you can just kind of put in a sling. You can't play football with a neck brace and if it's going to potentially lead to paralysis, uh, Ryan Shazier needs to be shut down for the rest of the year. Very light. Everything. Make sure that this guy is 100% because he's young. He's a franchise defensive player. You cannot risk a player like that. So understanding that two of the better defensive players in this game are not going to be in this game, what are we left with? We are left with an incredibly tight AFC North matchup that I cannot wait to watch. I'm going to stick with the Steelers here. Baltimore, I think, on the defensive side, lately, has been playing better than the Steelers have been, and it's very comparable one way or the other. The offenses are incredibly comparable. Pittsburgh's 4-1 and one at home. Baltimore is 500 on the road, which is basically what they've needed to do in years past. They're 500 on the road. They're not an easy out. Pittsburgh is undefeated within the division. Baltimore has lost a division game, obviously, against Pittsburgh. So this is a really close matchup one way or the other, but I got to give it to Pittsburgh if for no other reason than being the home team. Let's take Pittsburgh, see those Steelers rally around the Ryan Shazier injury. Let's take Pittsburgh at home to beat Baltimore. On the line, the Steelers are favored by a full touchdown at home. And I don't like that. I think this game's going to be closer than that. We're going to go Baltimore plus seven. It's worth pointing out the Steelers are only two and four against the spread this season as a favorite of a touchdown or more, which is exactly what they are right now. This number might go lower. It might be like six or maybe even five and a half by game time. So you might want to watch this number and you might want to jump on like, if you get a Pittsburgh minus five, you might want to grab that. But at minus seven, it's too much for me. Let's hedge our bets and go Baltimore plus seven, a game that the Ravens could realistically win. Total in this game is 41 points. The two teams are a combined 11 and 13 over under this season. That's a slight lean to the under, but with those two key incredible defensive players not playing in this football game, it's still such a low number. I expect it to climb, but grab the over now, over 41 points in Pittsburgh, Baltimore. All right, folks, let's do this platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week 14, 2017, 2018 NFL season. We're going to start at the bottom with the bronze pick. The bronze pick, I am 11 and 2 straight up. It's my best straight up mark in these picks. We're 7 and 6 against the spread and 1 11 and 1 on the over under. It's just comical at this point. My bronze pick sees the Green Bay Packers travel to Cleveland to take on the Browns. Now, the Browns, big ups to them from last week. They got it done against the spread, covering that 13.5 point underdog deficit that was really just, I, I understand why it was the way it was, but it was a little insulting to the Browns, and I knew they were going to cover that. Now they got to go home, they got to play the Packers, and the Packers have a lot to play for. Packers are one of those NFC bubble teams that currently sit at 6-6. Six and six. Brett Hundley has done enough. Just barely, but he's done enough to keep the Packers competitive, to keep them there, because next week, Rodgers could be back. He's practicing. He's throwing pretty close to how he was before, and just to get Aaron Rodgers back on the football field would be such a huge momentum and confidence boon to this Green Bay Packers team. But in order to do that, they got to win this week. Here's how it goes for the Packers. It's the true definition of a do or die. If they win this week, and it's a winnable game being in Cleveland, if they win this week, they're going to be right there with the Lions, the Falcons, and the Cowboys at 7-6. and six. They're going to be right there for that number two wildcard spot. 
They're they're I, I realize the Panthers are eight and four and the Seahawks are eight and four, but they're, it, they're still they're going to be there and the chance is going to be there. Then Rodgers comes back. The Packers basically the only shot that they have is to run the table. If Green Bay loses this week, you might as well shut Rodgers down for the rest of the year because what's the point in bringing him back, risking him re-injuring, having a bad offseason? You want him healthy. You want him ready to come back for 2018 because God knows Brett Hundley is not the quarterback of the future on this team. So you want Rodgers as healthy as possible. But if you've got an outside shot to get into the playoffs, I think you have to bring him back. And the only way they have that outside shot is by winning this football game. So I'm going to give it to them. I think the Packers are a good enough team. I think they display that they've got grit from last week. I think they're a good enough team, even without Ty Montgomery. They're a good enough team to win this football game. So let's take the Packers on the road in Cleveland to beat the Browns. On the line, the Browns are a three and a half point dog at home, which means Green Bay favored by three and a half on the road. Worth pointing out, Green Bay is actually three and one against the spread not only in their last four overall, but in their last four games on the road as well. Three and four is pretty good. It's a good number there. It's Cleveland. This is a beatable number. Let's go Green Bay minus the three and a half points. Total in this game is 40 and a half points. The two teams are a combined 13 and 11 over under. It's a slight lean towards the over and it's a low number. I think Cleveland can score their points on Green Bay. So let's go over 40 and a half. So, Packers beat the Browns straight up. We got Green Bay minus three and a half on the line on the road over 40 and a half points. That is your bronze pick. My silver pick where I am 10 and three straight up, 10 and three against the spread, which is my best against the spread mark on any of these picks and five and eight on the over under sees the Los Angeles Chargers at home playing host to the Washington Redskins. This is kind of an interesting uh, scheduling setup here by the NFL as you got both Los Angeles teams playing at home at basically the same time. One starts at the 405 Eastern spot and one starts at the 425 Eastern. Splitting loyalties in Los Angeles. That's a weird choice by the NFL. Not only do the suddenly streaking Chargers get to be at home, but they actually get a fairly favorable matchup here. Look, the Chargers, they've won three straight games. They've put themselves back into the conversation for winning this division. I think they've actually got the inside track to winning the division based on the defense. But they also get to welcome in a Redskins team that is only two and four on the road. They've only won two of their last five games. They lost last week. And the Chargers have won two of their three games against NFC opponents. This is a very winnable game for the Chargers. They're definitely the better team right now. They're at home. Let's go with it. Let's take the Chargers at home to beat the Redskins. Also worth pointing out, Redskins playing the second half of back-to-back road games after losing last week. On the line, the Chargers are favored by six points at home, which seemed like a high number to me at first, but... The Redskins are only 2-5 and five against the spread as an underdog of under a touchdown, which is what they are in this game at a plus 6. So let's take the Chargers there. Let's say the hot streak continues for them. Let's take the Chargers minus 6 at home against Washington. Total in this game is 46 points. The two teams are an even 12 and 12 over under this season. So no real lean there. But I think we're going to go with the over in this one. I think... The Chargers, they're scoring a lot of points lately. Washington's defense, not exactly playing great right now, aside from, of course, Josh Norman, who is excellent. But let's take the over in this one and go over 46 points. So, Chargers beat the Redskins at home. We've got the Chargers minus six on the line, over 46 points. That is your silver pick. My gold pick, Ryan, 10 and 3 straight up, 7 and 6 against the spread, and 8 and 5 on the over under. So, in total, probably my best pick across the season sees the Arizona Cardinals at home playing host to the Tennessee Titans. Arizona, one of the least reliable teams in football as far as I'm concerned this season. The defense has been bad, almost completely collapsed in on itself. They're 2-3 and three in their last five. They lost last week. They have won two out of three games against the AFC, but that's probably the only bright spot when you're looking at this matchup. 
You got the Titans, who, despite the fact that they're, you know, giving up more points than they've scored on the season, yet are still somehow 8-4, and four, which means when they lose, they get blown out. That's a problem. What's not a problem is they look across the schedule, they see Jacksonville has got a really tough game this week against Seattle. Granted, they get to be at home, but it's a really tough opponent. This is a game that Tennessee has to win. These two teams, Tennessee and Jacksonville, tied for the AFC South lead at 8-4. and four. This is Tennessee's chance to be the undisputed number one team leading the AFC South. And it's an opportunity that they cannot afford to give up. Tennessee, they've won two straight games. They've won their only game against NFC opponents so far this season, which means they got a number of NFC games left on the schedule. This is the one that they have to win. I'm going to take Tennessee on the road as the team with much more to play for in Arizona to beat the Cards. On the line, Arizona is a three-point dog at home, which means Tennessee's favored by three points on the road. We're still going to go Tennessee minus three. Titans have covered their last two games. It's only a field goal, so let's go with it. Let's take Tennessee minus three. Or if you will, lay the points. See, somebody's learning. Total in this game is 44 points. The two teams are 12 and 12 over under this season, so no significant lean one way or the other. But I have no faith in Arizona's defense whatsoever. And Tennessee is a team that's giving up more points than they're scoring. So both teams should be able to score in this one. Let's go over 44 points. So Tennessee beats Arizona in Arizona. We got Tennessee minus three on the spread over 44 points. That's your gold pick. And the platinum pick will come as no shock to anybody. I'm 10 and three straight up, seven and six against the spread and seven and six on the over under the Miami Dolphins playing host to the New England Patriots worth pointing out it's back-to-back road games for the Patriots they did win last week there's another AFC East matchup they own this division not going to talk about it any more than that sure they're not going to have Gronk although he is talking about appealing that suspension that was one of the dirtiest plays I've seen all season Gronk deserves the suspension appealing it is a stupid idea but I think he might appeal it so he may very well be in for this game but even if he's not Patriots all day. It's not going to matter. Take New England on the road to beat Miami. On the line, New England favored by 11 points on the road. So Miami, an 11-point dog at home. But I'm still going to tell you to take New England minus 11. It's less than two touchdowns. The Patriots are 5-1 and one against the spread in their last six heads-up matchups, head-to-head against Miami. So that's all that I need. New England minus the 11 points. Total in this game is 47. Two teams are combined 13 and 11 over under. Slight lean towards the over. Miami's defense has completely collapsed on itself. Take the over of 47 points. Anything under a 50, take the over on it. So we got New England on the road to beat Miami. We've got New England minus 11 against the spread. Over 47 points. That is your platinum pick. And just remember, these picks are streaking lately. All right, folks, those are your straight up against the spread and over under plays for week 14 of the 2017 NFL season. It's time now for the comment of the week from the week 13 video. And for the comment of the week, we're going right back to the well. We're going to Half Moon's Picks, Stephen Coleman, one of the best progs in the business. He had the comment of the week from week 13. His comment was, hey, you finally picked the Jags on an odd week. Nice instant win. That's of course with his theory that the Jags play much better on odd numbered weeks than they do on even numbered weeks. I do have to point out, I had picked the Jags four straight odd numbered weeks prior to last week. So I don't know what else Steven wants from me, but hey, you picked it. Nice instant win. Hey, I lost all those games last week as I took the points in my ATS pools, so I'm eating the crow this week. That's in reference to my platinum, gold, silver, and bronze from a couple of weeks ago where there were huge point spreads, but I took them anyway and wound up going, I think, three and one. If the CFL ever expands to the U.S., I may watch it because it's never played on TV here. They should consider playing it opposite the NFL if they want more coverage. This is a good opportunity to point out the CFL is actually played on television 
in the United States. I pointed this out to Andrew Warren as well. It's played on ESPN2, 3, and ESPN News. Across those three stations, you can check out every single regular season CFL football game between Thursday and Sunday of a given week. So that's just letting people know that, hey, there's a football alternative out there. It's the Canadian Football League. It's a hell of a lot of fun. It's worth watching. Good luck this week. I always enjoy the BWF insights. Stephen, thank you very much. I always enjoy your comments. And yours is the comment of the week from the week 13 video. All right, folks, the week 14 episode is in the books. That's it for me, Justin. Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube. Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. Enjoy the games in week 14. Christmas is getting ever closer. Don't forget to order your nerd tees. But most importantly, don't forget, this time of year, I feel that it's an imperative on decent human beings to give back in any and every opportunity that you can. If you have a chance to give back, please do so. Make sure you spend time with your family, maybe people that you don't get to see all that often throughout the year. It's incredibly important. Everyone has people in their lives that love them and that they love, and this is the time of year to spend time with those people. Enjoy the games in week 14. We will see you again in week 15, and good luck at the start of the fantasy playoffs. See you next week. 